Yay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm excited seeing people start coming in, seeing the attendees list grow. Hey. Hello. Hey, I'm watching everyone come in. We're just letting everyone get into the room. We start in a few minutes. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for joining us tonight. So there's a few more people still coming. I'm just gonna let everybody keep filtering in and we'll get started in a few minutes here. Give it another few seconds. And hi, everybody. Thank you all so much. Uh, let's see. Second. All right, while we're waiting for everyone to come on, I don't want to wait for too long, but um, let me say hi to everybody who's here. Thank you all so much for being on here tonight with us. Um, so while we're waiting, I want to go ahead and introduce a few people that you see in here, uh, some of the members of BIAD that have been totally instrumental in making this virtual conference a success. Um, so first we got the our BIAD executive director, Ms. Cheryl Doucette. We love her. We've got BIAD's executive administrative assistant, Zawaya McElrath. She is fabulous. She is She's our hero over here. Um, we've also got the board president, and she's also the co-chair of the conference committee, Dr. Terry Harrison Goldman, and our board's vice president and the other co-chair of the conference committee, Ms. Steph Lancaster, is here. And my name is Carly Lucas. I'm a member of BIAD's corporate board of directors. I'm the co-chair of the events and communications committee. Um, so I'm really happy to be your host for this second educational webinar in our conference series. And if you missed last week, um, you can still catch it on demand. You definitely want to take a look at the recording because it was so fascinating. It was a really great way to kick off the 2023 virtual conference webinar series. So with that all being said, thank you so much and welcome to session number two. This is going to be just as informative and super interesting. Um, we're really thrilled to have this group that we've got here joining us today, and we're confident a lot of other people are still going to be watching the recording on demand later on. So let's get started. Can we go to the next slide, Zawire? Do you want to wait another second? Or is it good? Okay. <laughs> All right. Like I said, I'm Carly. Lucas, I work at Delaware Elder Law Center, and we help families that are managed in the care of a loved one. All right. And let me thank some of our BIAD corporate board members and the BIAD advisory board members uh, for all their dedication and support. They've given their time their very impressive talent and their money to support the work that BIAD's doing in the community. So thank you all. And big thank you to the virtual conference planning committee 
for all the hard work, hard work you guys have been doing to make this a reality. It really could not have been done without every single one of you. So thank you guys. All right, let's thank all these fantastic sponsors. Um, we've got Del One Federal Credit Union, Encompass Health Middletown, Post Acute Medical, Pam, Health Dover, and Bay Health. Thank you guys for your support of this webinar series. And we want to thank the friends of Biad sponsors, Christiana Care Health Systems and Delaware Elder Law Center. Right. So through even more of the generous support of our sponsors, we're able to start our first annual Survivor Caregiver Celebration and Community Awards Luncheon to wrap up this entire Brain Injury Awareness Month. So this special event is going to be on Friday, March 31st, the last Friday of March, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's going to be held down at Harrington Volunteer Fire Company. Uh, that is at 20 Clark Street, Harrington, Delaware. So survivors and two of their caregivers are invited to join us free of charge. We would just love to have you there. Um, tickets for community members and professionals, that's in, in the $25, $25 for the tickets. And you can reach out to admin at biad.org if you want to register or purchase a ticket. So again, that's admin at biad.org. And we could not do any of this without the support of our sponsors. So thank you all again for the continued financial and community support. You guys are just all rock stars. All right, before we get started, we wanna see who's all joining us tonight, who's everybody in the room. So Zawai so is gonna put up a poll and if you could select the category that best describes your connection to the brain injury community. And while you're answering this, I wanna invite Zawaya to share some helpful information with you to maximize your conference experience. And Zawaya will also be providing technical support for the virtual conference series. So thank you so much, Zawaya. Thank you, Carly. Um, hello, everyone. Um, today's recorded session will be available for viewing post-conference. And if you have any questions for the presenters, can you please type them in the Q&A section? Questions will be monitored and collected um, throughout the presentation. And all um, questions will be answered at the end of the presentation to allow for speakers to present a more uniform in a more uniform manner. If you have any technical questions, please reach out using the Q&A function as the chat function has been disabled during this webinar. And for the best conference experience, we really would like for you to use your laptop or your desktop. If you are using a handheld device, you may miss some of the webinar features. So we want everyone to be able to participate fully. Um, please feel free to turn on your closed captions as I have turned on the closed captions and I hope that everyone can see them. You can click the CC button on the bottom of your screen. And I will be sending out a follow-up email in that email um, at each session, at the end of each session, I will send out an email and it will have helpful links, information for the BIA events um, planned for March and beyond. And for those taking advantage of the CEUs we are offering, please note that you must watch all five of the sessions to receive the um, five CEU credits. You must watch all five sessions to the end of the actual um, series and the session in order to participate. And there will be an assessment sent out once you email the um, code to me that will be given at the end of the session, I will send out an assessment and you answer those questions and then you'll get the link for the next actual session. And um, also um, I am asking all professional members, you are, um, you are eligible to take advantage of the CEUs offered at no charge and any non-members will need to pay for the CEUs or become a BIAD professional member. And please reach out um, at biad.org. At, at admin, not BIAD, admin, 
hold on, I slipped that, admin at viad.org with any questions about membership. And I'll turn it back over to Carly. Thank you. Thank you, Zawaya. Do we have the results yet of the poll? Wait, while we're waiting on that. Oh, no, here it is. Awesome. Let's see. Oh, so this is fabulous. We've got um, a lot of survivors here of you know living with brain injury. We've got even more family members and friends. We've got some really supportive people in the crowd here. We got advocates. We've got some speech therapists, social workers, counselors, care managers. Um, we've got a service provider employee and a government employee. So awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining. That's really awesome to see everybody's here. Um, and let me also talk about uh, one of the events that's coming up for BIAD, where actually Dr. Kumar, who's one of our um, board members, is doing a really awesome screening of the house we lived in. Um, that is on, I believe, Monday the 26th. And it's actually going to be on Zoom. Um, so anybody can join from anywhere. We're going to be screening the film and then having a Q&A with the creator of the film. So it's going to be really interesting, really fascinating, totally free to anybody. Um, so let us know also if anybody is interested in that. We can send the Zoom link and the information for you. It's going to be a really interesting event. And again, that's a Dr. Haresh Kumar from our board is putting this on. Uh, so it was really generous of him. And we're very excited for that. So let's see, um, you know, without further ado, let me talk about our fabulous Maggie Kalanick here. Um, tonight's topic is cognitive communication disorders following traumatic brain injury. And Maggie is from Defy Therapy Services. So Maggie Kalanick is a speech language, speech language pathologist with a passion for rehabilitation and acquired brain injury. She completed her undergraduate studies at the University of Maryland, received her master's at University of Texas, Dallas in 2011, and obtained her ASHA certificate of clinical competence in 2012. Maggie started her career in Baylor Rehab Hospital Day Neuro Program, working with adults with acquired brain injury, and then Maggie located in 2013, she came back on home to Delaware and she joined Moore's pediatric rehab team, which is amazing. Um, so during her career, Maggie's work to specialize in the assessment and treatment of cognitive communication disorders, dysphagia, and management of trach vents. Maggie's goal in starting her private practice, Defy Therapy Services, is to help meet the ongoing needs of survivors and caregivers post-acute and rehab stage. Maggie's excited to work towards building a better network and support for those with a brain injury in the state of Delaware. So with that, I hand it over to you, Maggie. Thank you, Carly. That was a lovely introduction. I appreciate it. And thanks to the Brain Injury Association for inviting me to have uh, this discussion tonight. Um, I hope that you're all ex as excited as I am about this topic by the time I'm done. So let's get rolling. Um, I have no disclosures really, um, but I just want to let everybody know that I have, I'm not associated nor receive compensation or endorsements from any of the products in this presentation. The objectives for tonight, um, at the conclusion of this lecture, I would love for you guys to be able to demonstrate an understanding of cognitive communication deficits and their impact on functioning follow up, following a brain injury, identify strategies to improve communication with someone who has an acquired brain injury, identify environmental accommodations to improve cognitive communication functioning, and to identify activities of daily living that target cognitive communication skills. So Carly did a really good job in talking about my background, but um, just so you guys know, yep, I started at Baylor Health um, in the adult neuro world, and then I came home to Delaware for Nemours. Um, I was at Nemours for 10 wonderful years, learned a lot, met a lot of great people, 
um, but then decided that I needed to go out on my own and uh, address some of the community needs that we have here in Delaware. So I got involved with the Brain Injury Association back in 2014 when I um, came home and uh, I facilitate one of the support groups, the caregiver support group um, plug, which uh, meets on the first Thursday of the month. So there's my shameless plug for any caregivers out there who have not joined us, please uh, email Zawaya and she'll give you the information to join us. All right, so communication. So when a lot of us think of communication, we think about talking, but the art of communication is a lot more than just our voice um, and what we're saying. We communicate with a lot more than just our voice. Um, you have your speech, yes, your voice, your articulator, so the way that your mouth and your tongue move together, um, but you also have the influence of language, so the words that we use and um, how we use those words to communicate our wants and needs, but also we, a lot of our communication is impacted by our cognition. And what I mean by that is our attention, our memory, our executive functioning, and all of this I will dive into further. But overall, the communication is the active process of exchanging information and ideas. So what's a speech therapist's role in brain injury? Um, my favorite line is to say, okay, you're probably confused about why you're sitting here because you can speak just fine. We do a lot more for brain injury than just articulation and speech. Um, speech is part of the evaluation, is part of the goals that we work on, um, but, but we also look at language. So how do you express feelings and thoughts? How do you understand what other people are saying to you? Are you able to read? Are you able to write? Um, we also look at what's called pragmatic. So that's that social communication. So everything that we do subconsciously um, when we're interacting with somebody else. So our eye contact, our personal space, maintaining personal space, um, our body language, our facial expressions. So that verbal and that nonverbal language coming together. Um, as well as the role of cognition on um, speech and language. So um, attention, you need attention, memory, you need the ability to problem solve, you need the ability to reason, to understand language, both written and um, verbal, as well as feeding skills, depending on the, the patient. So looking at how somebody eats? Um, do they chew their food appropriately? Are they swallowing? Are they clearing the back of their throat? Um, and then making recommendations to the medical team to, for diet advancement. So I stumbled upon this um, model of cognitive communication, and I love it because when you look at it, it looks really complex. And I have to tell you, cognitive communication is really complex. So I, I think this is a great depiction. Um, Sheila McDonald is a uh, worldwide known researcher of cognitive communication. I think she did a great job um, depicting it, but I wanna kind of walk through it so that you guys understand what you're looking at. So on the left-hand side where it says, um, individual domain. When they, when she says that, it's what is the person coming to the, the conversation or the social interaction have already? So it takes into consideration, you know, your um, age, your sex, um, your level of education, your cultural background, um, your goals, and any type of previous knowledge that you had maybe before your accident. And then it also brings to the table the communication after the accident. So what was the um, the severity of the injury? What was the nature of the injury? Where are you in the recovery of your injury? So those things you just come to the table with before you even open your mouth. Now, if you look at the top um, contextual domain, that is talking about the things that we need to consider in the communication demands of the individual, the communication partner, 
and the evaluating and modifying of envi environments for success. So this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in depth um, a little bit later, but this is your um, factors influencing function. Uh, if you've worked with me before, you've heard me say that until I'm blue in the face, but it really does depend. The environment does indicate or it does set a, a precedent for communication skills. So if I'm talking to a professor, I'm going to talk a little bit different than if I'm talking to, um, you know, my mom or dad. Um, and then underneath it, she pulled out what's called self-regulation and control functions. So when I was first looking at this, I was like, mm, I'm having a little hard time understanding what that is. So to break it down for you, it is important in coordinating, integrating, and regulating the cognitive and communication processes. So it's kind of like running the show. So what do I mean by that? These are things like the ability to initiate a social interaction, the ability to regulate your emotions, the ability to inhibit undesired responses, um, like for example, like jumping in and interrupting somebody or saying inappropriate language um, during a conversation. Um, but it also helps with the goal-directed communication. So what is the goal of you communicating at this time? And how do you stay on topic? And how do you continue um, to have that interaction and achieve your goal of communicating what you need to say? Um, but at the same time, it takes a lot of that higher level cognitive skills to self-monitor. So are you aware of what you're saying? Are you able to utilize strategies if you need to? Are you able to recognize when, when your communication is breaking down and implement some sort of repair to it? And then at the same time, you're trying to adapt to what the other person is saying and feeling and, and diving into. So before we even get to cognition, communication, emotional and physical, we're doing all of this stuff to regulate and, and facilitate our communication skills. So I really liked that she pulled all of that out because I think it makes a difference. And I think when we looked at our loved ones who have had a brain injury, it gives you a little bit more perspective in what they're trying to do and the heavy load that they're carrying when they're just trying to have that conversation. So um, she does highlight the emotional, oh, we're going back one more, sorry. Um, she does highlight the emotional um, and physical changes that can happen after a brain injury, which is very important. Um, she highlighted in her research, um, the level of fatigue, which I'm sure if you're a caregiver or your survivor, you're well aware that the level of fatigue is a big factor when you're trying to communicate. But then she also break, breaks down the cognition and the communication. All of this goes into what's called communication competence. So if you look at this box, it's really interesting to look at how she breaks it down. So she breaks it down for family uh, communication. Sorry, I have my glasses on, I'm looking at it. Um, workplace communication, academic communication. So we have to do all of this to decide how we're going to speak appropriately in the workplace, how we're going to speak appropriately and interact in an academic environment. So it goes to show all of this stuff works together so that we can have an appropriate conversation depending on the context. Very long-winded, but I thought it was really important to show how much we do every day by just having a conversation. All right. So um, speech and language deficits after a brain injury. So there's different types of um, language and speech deficits that can occur. Um, as many of you might be aware, every brain injury is different. So we can't necessarily say that this is going to, this is what your brain injury is going to look like. And this is what your language is going to look like. But we have 
overarching themes um, that we look for when we're treating. One being aphasia, which is difficulty producing and or understanding language. Um, so this might present as word finding errors, or it could be completely um, disfluent with different words, with nonsense words in there. And I'm gonna give you a good example of that in the next slide. Apraxia is, the inability to coordinate movements of the lip, tongue, um, vocal cords, and diaphragm. So this a lot of times happens with um, damage to the cerebellar region. So that it's in charge of the coordination of gross motor movements, but it also is in charge of coordination of your fine motor movements. So somebody with apraxia may have difficulty as the length of utterance or length of what they're saying gets longer. They have trouble with um, that sequencing of their articulators. So their tongue, their, their lips, their cheeks, their jaw, doing all of that to get, to get the words out. Dysarthria, on the other hand, is a motor speech disorder due to reduced strength and mobility of the lips, tongue, vocal folds, and diaphragm. Um, so this is more of a structural change and um, a strength and coordination, not as much coordination, a strength and movement type of disorder that we can see following a brain injury. So I just stumbled upon this um, resource and I highly recommend it. Um, Zawaya is going to get us out of here so she, we can watch this video, but it's called Interactability. And I um, want every caregiver to write this down or uh, anyone involved with brain injury. It's inter, I N T E R dash A B I dash ility, uh, L I T Y. Um, and it is a program that I found out of Sydney, Australia, I believe, that um, really works on or really provides good education and videos on cognitive communication disorders and like how to train partner training is what they call it, um, how to train people to effectively communicate with your loved one that's had a brain injury. So if you guys get a chance, it's free. Um, I think it's phenomenal. So, you know, Aunt Linda who came in, um, who hasn't seen your loved one, you can say, Aunt Linda, before you come, log on to this and watch these modules. It's pretty in depth, uh, talks about different types of cognitive communication disorders, it tells, it even runs you through how not to talk to someone who's had a brain injury. So it's very informative and I highly recommend it. Um, there we go. So we're gonna watch this video on different ways communication can be affected by a brain injury. Oh, I don't hear any sound. Hold on. So this um, resource also has, they teach um, communication strategies and they teach about cognitive communication um, through videos. And this is one of the videos that I found on the, on the training. But like I said, it's free. Um, it has lots of modules and lots of um, different ways to look at cognitive communication. What I'm saying could not be much just for nothing. I can say moon. Why? I don't know. Cigarette. Cigarette. I like that. I don't know why. So uh, I could, but I only had maybe four names. Now, and do a lot of them, but the numbers are very hard to put them together. Nope. So you kind of get an idea. There was supposed to be a video with that, but you it you kind of get an idea of um, this man has. A, oh, it's still playing. 
We're having a little technical difficulty here. So, so the first gentleman you heard, he has a form of aphasia. Um, so if you were confused about what he was saying, that was his communication. So he was trying to put words together and he was coming up with nonsense words. He was saying the wrong word. Um, and he was really trying to get his point across um, and what we couldn't see because the video, but he was using his gestures to try to help him uh, communicate. So you can see number one, uh, this actually worked out because number one, you can see how hard it is for him to put all of his words together and, and really self monitor and he didn't realize he was saying the wrong words. Um, but on the other hand, us as a listener, we got kind of a good idea of how sometimes the comprehension is impaired after a brain injury. So you and I didn't have any visual input and we were just hearing the speech. And that speech wasn't making sense to us. And that's, that also gives you a great perspective on how, you know, you can still hear what's going on, but you can't uh, understand because your language centers are unable to um, translate and make sense of what you're hearing. Well, it looks like we might try again. Maggie, if we can't get this working, it's okay. we'll, we'll send a link in the follow-up material so everybody yeah. will be able to, to access it, but we might get it working here. Yeah, no problem. This is what I get for trying to be fancy. Then I start knowing right. what I'm saying. Good, nothing, not just for nothing. I can say moon. Why? I don't know. Big red. So you saw four different types of communication disorders in that two minute video. So you had the first guy who was what we call non-fluent aphasia. So he 
was trying to get through, figure out his words to say. He was saying nonsense words. Um, and he really relied a lot on his gestures and repairs and stuff like that to get through what he wanted to say. The second girl was more of a dysarthria. So she had more of a slurred type of speech. Um, her vocal um, quality was lower, maybe a little bit breathier. Um, and she was quieter. Um, because her breast support wasn't as strong. So all of those factors play into that dysarthria. The third girl is more of a higher level cognitive communication. So she was talking about how those um, external strategy or external factors like fatigue um, and stuff really impact her communication. Um, and then she was also talking about how she's impulsive and she really doesn't have a filter anymore, which is, I think, pretty good awareness. Whether or not they just told her that over and over again, I don't really know. And then the fourth woman who was talking um, really hit home about the processing. So she thinks she needs a lot more processing time to understand what's being said to her, but then also to organize her thoughts and get um, her thoughts out. Um, it takes a lot longer for her. And sometimes with memory issue, you can lose track of what you are trying to say um, in, in the process of trying to get those words out. So I really do, I don't, again, I don't work for this company, but I really do recommend going out, um, going to their website, interability, interability, um, and uh, checking it out because it's a great free resource. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what, these are two different slides here going on. Um, we're gonna go back a little bit. This is why, yeah, for some reason. All right, well, uh, for some reason, two slides are on one. We're really just kicking it here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> You're going to just uh, have to bear with me. But um, some cognitive deficits uh, following a, a brain injury um, is what's behind that slide. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is when I say cognition, what do I mean? So I mean attention and processing. I mean um, memory. So like short-term memory, long-term memory, um, working memory. Uh, and then when I when I'm talking about reasoning, we're looking at you know the ability to identify relevant information, the ability to get all the facts and eliminate what you don't need, um, and then take those facts and then integrate it together to draw conclusions, to make inferences, and to do all that fun stuff. Um, and then when you're talking about executive functioning and problem solving, you're really looking more at the ability to plan um, initiate, plan, um, self-monitor, okay, how are things going, um, and then repair if you need to, if you're not able to express what you want to um, as you're going along. So um, the, sorry, I'm a little lost here. Um, so no, so I'll go back to that last one. Um, so all of these factors come together. And what I'm trying to say in the purple um, slides were all of the factors come together and they start to impact those activities of daily living. So I'm talking about the listening uh, comprehension. So they might have um, difficulty with processing vocabulary, understanding um, sarcasm and irony, um, understanding figurative language and complex semantic or synthetic relations or syntactic relationships. So it's really about like putting those things together and really understanding what you're talking about. And again, there's a continuum here, right? So you might have somebody who um, has very little 
interaction maybe with like listening to things and they might have everything accessed as a reading so it's not that big of a deal but then you might have somebody who's in school for example and doing a lot of lectures where they have to really rely on that um, listening comprehension and that ability to break things down and understand um the other thing that is impacted by um brain injuries are the verbal expression and discourse. So what I mean by that is being able to say what you want to say. Um, so a lot of times uh, with cognitive communication deficits, um, you might have somebody that's tangential or talks too much. You might have somebody who doesn't say enough. So there's it's very sparse conversations. Um, it you also may have what's called press speech so it's that person who's like what? i have to tell you everything and i can't wait and i'm interrupting you um and then you may have somebody who's a little bit more reserved and, and will only answer in one or two word um, responses um from a pragmatic perspective um you might have a little bit of flat affect, um, disregard for personal space, difficulty with topic maintenance, turn taking. Um, they really stress this whole theory of mind um, or our understanding that others have mental states, thoughts, beliefs, desires, and intentions. Um, they are um, able to, they are, are having a hard time thinking outside of themselves. And I hate I hate the word egocentric, but a lot of times people who have had a brain injury are, are egocentric because they have a hard time understanding and thinking outside themselves to relate to other people. So that might be something that we work in, on in speech therapy. From a reading comprehension perspective, you could have um, deficits in decoding. So actually um, being able to tease out the words and the sounds behind them, difficulty with tracking when they're reading, um, their speed of processing, their ability to um, inference or be able to pick out the important information integrated to learn new concepts, um, as well as um, their stamina. So they might be able to read for a certain amount of time and then they get tanked. Lastly, we could see deficits in written expression, which a lot of times that written expression mirrors the verbal output. Um, so you might see writing too much, writing not enough, not including all the relevant information, um, difficulty with finding the right words, maybe their, their thoughts are out of order, um, but all of that um, fun stuff is what we try to tease through to see, okay, here's where the deficits are and then what accommodations or strategies can we put in place to help them become an effective communicator. So I wanted to highlight this because cognitive communication is a huge part of who we are and our identity. And when someone sustains a brain injury and has trouble communicating, there can be bigger ramifications if this is a long-term problem. So we really need to make sure that these services are given to the people that need them and that we figure out the best strategies and we help support any deficits so that these long-term effects may not happen. So um, there has been um, research that's shown that people with a brain injury could get into more legal trouble. They might have a higher um, instance of anxiety and depression. Um, they could be more vulnerable to abuse or violence um, because their decision-making skills are not firing on all cylinders. So they have, there might be missing pertinent information. They might not be um, 
you know, filtering what they need to. Um, you can also see a lot of social isolation, difficulty in maintaining social relationships and difficulty with occupation. Um, so going back to school and work. So, you know, these are just very few of these um, external factors that can happen. And we um, just got to make sure that we're staying on top of it and um, trying to get the communication out to really help avoid these secondary effects. So the meat and potatoes of this um, communication strategy. So how can you help at home or how could you help in your clinic or how can you help um, you know, in your medical practice, um, somebody who has a communication uh, difficulty. So these are some suggestions um, to think about when interacting with someone who's had a brain injury. Um, I always, always, always emphasize address the person re with respect and utilize age appropriate language. There's nothing that gets my goat more than walking in and watching somebody talk like a like they're a baby to a 17 year old or a 30 year old. You know, they, we have to respect who they are um, and speak to them at a level that is respectful and, to their age and level of, you know, education and cognition prior to all of this. We do recommend that you slow the rate of speech down. Um, you know, that's a, a, a a tight rope to walk because you want to slow your rate down, but you don't want to talk like you're talking to a baby. Um, so just monitoring your rate of speech, simplifying directions and explanations, giving one direction at a time, allowing for processing time, and then give the next direction. Um, using visual supports whenever you can, allow for extra time, extra time for processing, I already said that. Um, avoiding humor, sarcasm, or abstract language is helpful because it's hard, again, for them to, to make inferences or think outside of what is being said. A lot of times the thinking is what we term as concrete. So they're taking things at face value. So if you use humor or sarcasm, a lot of times it might go over their head which is my next point is keep communication concrete in nature, um, avoid complete, uh, avoid completing the person's train of thought unless they elicit it from you. Um, when possible, ask yes, no questions. Um, we call these closed ended questions rather than open ended questions. So maybe instead of saying, um, how was your weekend? which is a very open and kind of scary question. Um, you can say, did you have a good weekend? Yes or no. Or how was your weekend? Did you go visit so-and-so or did you stay home and relax? It gives them choices to be able, so they don't have to pull this out on their own. Um, if possible, prompt um, the person to describe or use another word if they're having trouble with the, finding the right words. Um, and then brainstorm sp person specific topics to um, discuss if you're going like to a party or something you say like, Uncle Frank, we haven't seen him for a while. These are the things Uncle Frank likes to do. Um, let's think of some questions and some comments and things we could tell Uncle Frank so that they're kind of thinking about all of this prior to going into that social situation. And then establishing a code word um, or a nonverbal cue to help person, the people identify when they're having trouble. So, you know, you don't ever really want to embarrass your loved one. So having like a code word or a something that they can remember to kind of help them self-monitor and say, oh, I'm off topic or, oh, I must be getting tired, let's leave, um, is always um, helpful to uh, exit when you need to. Um, I included this communication style uh, identification chart. I just like it. So um, I thought I'd include it. A lot of this is what I already talked about, but it kind of allows you to go through and like 
check off what you've been doing and kind of self-reflect. So some environmental strategies. Um, when you are interacting with someone who's had a brain injury, we have to remember that the brain has a hard time filtering out external factors. So they have difficulty um, if somebody is talking behind directly behind them, they might have difficulty filtering that out to pay attention to what you are saying or in, interact with you. So kind of taking note of what the environment looks like and reducing any distractions um, will help that your loved one be um, successful in their communication um, goals. So um, when I say reduce visuals, so like uh, in the clinic, uh, we have a room that's a developmental room and it has toys everywhere. So if I have somebody who has a hard time focusing and like getting through a conversation, I might go into a different room that has no toys visual. Um, so it's not one tempting, but two, it's not distracting to them as you're trying to have a conversation. Um, an example for Another one would be turn off the TV, turn off any music, allow that person to, to attend to just you and process what's going, what's coming out of your mouth and what you need them to be able to respond with. Set clear expectations and goals, consider the time of day and the level of fatigue um, for the person with a brain injury when you're um, engaging with them. Um, it's probably not a good idea to have important conversations at the end of the day because with fatigue comes lack of attention and difficulty processing and likely increased memory deficits. I always say establish a routine to help with um, prediction and uh, to work towards independence. You, if you can start a routine in your house, just in general, from day one and do the same routine, even with the most severe memory deficits, you, after a while, it might take months, but you will start to see some carryover and in independence um, in doing activities of daily living. Um, so if that's like the best thing to do. However, if you have to veer from your routine, I would highly recommend having that discussion with your loved one prior to veering from your routine because that flexibility of thought can be hard too. So changing from one way to another um, may invoke stress and anxiety and possible behaviors. Um, I would always recommend following up conversations with written format, for, especially for conversations that are important. That way it's written down. Um, if your loved one has a hard time recognizing your handwriting or their handwriting, sometimes I'll say like, okay, we're going to sign it. So we both read it and we both were present. So it, it cuts down on confusion um, after, like if you come back to it. Um, break large tasks and conversations into smaller parts to help with cognitive endurance and prevent overstimulation and always encourage cognitive breaks or structure your day um, where you have a good mix of cognition tasks and physical tasks. So um, a good way to improve endurance is by switching back and forth. So maybe if you're, I don't know, reading a book, um, you read for 20 minutes and then you get up and take a walk reset and then you can sit down back down and read for another 20 minutes. Um, it allows, it helps with that endurance and decreasing it maybe any, any symptoms that might um, come up with the onset of fatigue. So um, in the beginning of the presentation, I talked about environmental factors. Um, that may influence functioning. Um, and this is what I was talking about. So factors that influence function, time of day, the amount of sleep at night, um, external distractions and internal distractions, the number of details you have to consider at the same time. Um, is this a new task or is it something that they've done before and it's kind of second nature to them? Um, do you have a certain amount of time allotted for the task or can you take your sweet time and fill it out um, to the best of your ability within 
you know, the day? Um, or you, can you take breaks and come back to it? Uh, the accuracy required. So like a lot of times with like work um, type, uh, see now I'm getting tired and my awards are, are falling. Um, with worker academic tasks, your, your accuracy is going to be rated, right? So um, do you do those types of tasks in the morning when you're really refreshed and good to go? Or are you more of, of a night owl? So you do it at night when you feel more refreshed. So kind of looking at doing important things when you have your best energy and mental set. Um, pain obviously can be a huge distractor, interest level, huge distractor. I talk about this all the time with kids. Um, you know, we're not always engaged and, uh, interested in what we're learning at school, but regardless, you have to, learn, you have to learn it to be able to pass the test. So, um, trying to figure out how to engage interest, um, to understand and recall information. The length of time you have to stick with the task or can you take breaks um, when the mixture again of cognitive and physical fatigue. So um, is this a, a task that requires you to sit down for four hours and use your brain or is this something that you can do a little bit and then get up and do a, a physical task and then come back to it. Okay, I'm not gonna read through all of these things, but for the clinicians out there, um, the International Cognitive Consortium, I believe is what they're called, um, is a group of professionals and researchers that sat down and looked at um, the research for cognitive communication, but they've also done it for attention, memory, executive functioning, um, and attention, memory, of executive functioning and processing, I believe. Um, but they originally met in 2014 and they read all the research and kind of analyzed what was coming out. And they said, they set guidelines for us professionals on how we should be treating this population. They just came out with new guidelines in 2023. So this is hot off the press, guys. Um, but I would highly recommend if you work with brain injured um, patients that you familiar, familiarize yourself with this um, article. Um, it has a lot of great uh, information on how we should approach um, rehabilitation, um, partnership training, modifying the environment, doing all of that type of stuff. Um, so I've included a lot of this for your reference. So I, I think we could skip like two of them. So I will, if you're interested, I can get you the PowerPoint too, um, to look at that. So before we watch these videos, um, I guess it was last year, two years ago, I decided to become more social media savvy and I um, ended up doing a functional Friday video on my social media. So these are taken from that that time. Um, but what I wanted to highlight in those media, social media posts were how do we as, you know, caregivers, survivors, um, professionals, how do we address cognitive communication in the home? How do we make it functional? What, when we say functional, what does that mean? How do, what type of skills are we working on if we do something? So I, went through and I show you three videos today, but one's gonna be on how to do oh, the cognitive skills behind doing take two. Oh my gosh, I'm losing it, sorry. How to um, order takeout. So that um, the other one's gonna be um, texting. So addressing cognitive communication goals with texting. And then the third one is going to be how to modify games to make it harder or easier, depending on what your loved one needs to work on. So Zawaya is going to pull those up. So you might get a little more information about me than you'd care to know, but um, just remember these are from 
social media. So I was engaging all of my people. And I'm gonna keep talking until they come up. Um, oh, all right, good. So this is the one about texting. Good morning, happy Friday. Today we're gonna to look at texting and we're going to see how you can use a simple text exchange to address your speech and language goals. So if you notice, I initiated the conversation because my goals for the session were to answer questions. Um, therefore, I'm giving her who, what, where, when, and how questions to answer and she is relaying the details of an event that she participated in. Um, you'll notice that I prompt her to make a longer sentence and add more details. So we're really working on sentence structure and expanding that length of utterance, um, as well as using her short-term recall to tell me about an event that she participated in over the weekend. So again, something that you would be very invested in or your loved one would be probably invested in is that everyday use of texting. So how do you approach those goals um, and do something that they're invested in? This one's take out. Good morning, happy Friday, we made it. I don't know about you guys, but uh, we've had some crazy weather here on the East Coast um, and we finally have a beautiful day. So I'm taking advantage by sitting outside to do this one. Um, but I'm going to show you a way that uh, I work with my clients on a number of speech goals. Um, and it's as easy as ordering takeout. Create a checklist to help with organization and planning. Target expressive and receptive language goals by taking orders and writing notes. Navigating the website helps target sequencing. Looking at notes while completing the order helps with alternating attention. Double checking your order targets attention to detail and self monitoring. Who knew using all these skills would lead to Friday night dinner? <laughs> Enjoy. So, as you can see, all of these are very functional tasks um, to implement, and it targets so many cognitive communication skills. So, and you don't even have to start with, you know, the, the, the texting online or whatever. Start with taking orders. Okay, you're in charge of taking orders today. Um, what does everybody want? Write it down and bring it to me and then I'll order for takeout. So you can simplify or you can make it a little more complex to, depending on where your loved one is in their recovery. And then this last one is going to be modifying games. Good morning, happy Functional Friday. This episode is brought to you by very little sleep and multiple tries at this video. But anyway, um, a lot of times after a brain injury, people have difficulty finding the right words they want to say, whether it's in conversation or if it's direct naming skills. So I thought we could look at a game called Anomia, um, which really does a nice job of challenging those word finding skills. And we can tweak it as clinicians to make it easier or harder, um, depending on the skill level needed. So let's take a look. Use the category cards and a timer to see how many you could get in a minute. Play against someone to see who can get the category first and count how many cards you have at the end. Or using the directions as intended, using the symbols and naming categories under a time pressure against different opponents. So you'll see that we took one game and we made it a little bit easier. We made it a little bit harder. We can change the, the demand. We can pull away um, the time pressure, but you can really modify these games so that you can still play and still have fun, but work your way up to playing it the way it was intended. All right, so for the next few slides, I don't really, have to, to go through it in depth, but I wanted to include some games that are great for eliciting cognitive communication skills. 
Um, the benefits to playing games is that they're low cost, they're fun, people are usually motivated. Um, it provides a purposeful activity, it allows for a family and friend to interact. Action. Um, it also, you know, for those siblings who maybe have not been a part of the recovery as much because it's hard, you know, to balance that, um, it pulls the siblings in. So pulling the siblings in to, to play a game and figure out whether that game needs to be a little bit easier, a little bit harder, what kind of cueing do you have to give? Um, it kind of gives them a role um, and it kind of normalizes working on these goals. Um, it's therapy that everyone can participate in and it works to create new memories. Some of my favorites that I like to use are taboo categories and blurble. Um, again, a lot of these are very language based, but you can uh, modify by using timer or not using timers, using timers, allow the use of restrictive words, allow gestures, maybe have them acted out. Um, and uh, you can work in teams and you can, um, you know, pull away whatever you need. I know in categories, you can roll a dice and then come up with words according to that letter on the dice. Well, don't use the dice. Let's just come up with words in these categories. Okay, let's take away the timer. You don't need to use the timer. Let's work on categories. Hey, why don't you and your brother work together and me and dad are going to work together and we'll see who could get the best ones, you know? So, quietly pulling away those restrictions to allow for success and engage in fun, but still working on them. Same with catchphrase, gestures, Pictionary, all the same ideas. Um, when we work on word finding uh, as clinicians, a lot of times we stress how, okay, you can't find that word. How else are you going to get that, that word across or your point across? So gestures and drawing and all of these th things also work on word finding strategies or you know thinking outside of the box when you can't get to the words that you want. Guess who's great? You have to hold on to the information um, that you're at. You have to ask questions. You have to hold on to the information. You have to look at the details in the pictures. Um, you have to do a lot of great stuff um, during Guess Who. Headbands, same type of thing. You don't know what's on your head. Someone can either describe it to you. You could ask questions. You can ask yes, no questions. You can do open-ended questions. Uh, you could do modify it in so many different ways. Um, and then these are for littler guys, but like Mr. Potato Head, you know, um, naming body parts or put the nose on, where does it go? Or following directions, Play-Doh, again, following directions. Oh, what did you make? Or explaining expressive language. I made a snowman. The snowman is doing what? Okay, well, the snowman's melting now. Um, so kind of uh, engaging in that play to hit those, those target goals expressively, receptively, even like imaginary play, all that type of stuff. 20 questions is a great one to do in the car. Um, it targets asking questions, um, remembering what you've already asked, uh, deductive reasoning, uh, categories, memory, all that type of stuff. And then I spy is a good one in the car too. So scanning, um, describing things, all that fun. Some other great games, um, if you ever come into the Nemours gym, Uno is a fabulous one. Uh, they love Uno in our gym. Spotted is also great. It's a visual processing where you have to figure out which um, pictures match and you try to do it quickly. Again, you can modify it where you go against the timer or you could go against yourself. Scrabble, Outburst, Battleship, any, any game, honestly, any game uses cognitive, cognitive skills and you can integrate communication around it. These are my resources. Thank you so much um, for your time. Okay, I think I'm... Thank you so much, Maggie. Oh my goodness. 
That was a roller coaster. I'm sorry. And thank you for everybody who held on with me. Totally rocked it. Oh my gosh. Yes, I loved it. So thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you, everyone who was here tonight. Um, really appreciate all this that you put together. All this information was amazing. Um, you're just like such a resource to the community. So this was fantastic. Thank you again. And um, really quick, before we go into question answer, I want to correct what I said earlier to everybody about the film screening. That is Monday the 27th, <laughs> and that is at 6 p.m. Um, again, that's the screening of the house we lived in. Um, that's essentially like the filmmaker, his father had a traumatic brain injury and it, so it goes through a lot of like memories and um, just what it was like living with the survivor. So it's, it's a really beautiful film. Um, so that's what is being filmed on the 27th at six o'clock on Zoom. Please let us know if anyone's interested, it's free. So, all right, now I wanna get into the question and answers. Um, let me look down in the question and answer, see if we have anything yet. You guys can. I think I have some here. Okay. I've got a few too, just for myself. But if anybody, if you go down to the bottom of the screen, you guys, there's a Q&A box. Um, that's where you can type in your questions for Maggie or, um, you know, comment on anything, get some more information. Um, Carly, my... I just sent you all the questions, honey. Look in your, look in the look in your chat box. And I have got them. Yes, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay. Let me start out. Question number one, can a brain injury be detected on an MRI imaging if it happened at birth four years ago? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it, it depends on how severe the brain injury was. Um, uh, I would, yeah, I don't, I really don't know the answer to that question. It's a more of a medical question. I'm sorry. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, next one under aphasia. Can you give an example of narratives, narratives without content? Yes, absolutely. So a narrative without content is talking, 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 talking without really any direction um in what you're saying and um any um information so they might jump all over the place they might um you know just use very vague wording and so you know that thing that we and then we went to do that thing and we it was a lot of um i felt something about that and it was it, but it was a really cool something i got to tell you so that is an example um, of a narrative without content. It's kind of like stream of consciousness. Yeah, but missing the words, missing the main idea, missing the con like the the meat and potatoes of what you're trying to say. So that you kind of leave your listener like, uh, I got nothing. Okay. All right. Next one is speech dyspraxia still used as a diagnosis. Uh, not, I haven't come across that as much. Usually it's more of an apraxia. Um, the, the, the terms have been changing a little bit, um, but they might be like older clinicians might use that a little bit more um, than newer ones. But I would, I would equate that to, to speech dyspraxia is almost like an apraxia. Um, where you have difficulty with coordinating the the movements of the mouth and, and the voice. Right. Awesome. And how do I find a speech therapist that works on cognition? Uh, you ask. You ask. Um, so I honestly would say, you know, when you are trying to find a speech therapist, you want to make sure that they work on cognition because um, not everybody does. And they will tell you that, um, which is kind of I don't really understand it, but there's people who keep them separate. But I think we are again, moving with the research into more of a world where the, that cognitive and that communication are being addressed together. But I would definitely just ask 
um, when you're making your phone calls. Hey, do you target cognitive communication? Because that's what we need. Okay, thanks for that one. Uh, let's see, what are some suggestions on how to help with generalization of skills when you work in a clinic? Eh, oh, that's a really good one. Um, you want to Im involve the family. You want to involve um, people outside of their world as much as possible because they are going to be your reporters. They're going to come back and say, this went well, this did not go well. How do we prompt? How do we change the environment? How do we facilitate a successful communication outside of these walls? It is very hard to, to do that as a clinician, but pulling in for your treatment sessions, trying to, uh, the research really highlighted that the context is huge for brain injury. Generalization, so being able to take one skill and put it across multiple areas of your life, it's very hard following a brain injury. So the research says be as specific in those tasks as you can, like I showed you. Okay, maybe it's today we're going to work on ordering takeout. We're going to do X, Y, and Z in our clinic to try to order takeout. And maybe you order takeout and it comes to the door. Um, but kind of pulling in with the family's input, what are some things that you guys do during the day? How much uh, support are they requiring and how can we work on increased independence in these communication um, tasks? Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, somebody wrote, Maggie, this is great information. I fully agree. <laughs> I regularly use slowing down at the pace of my speech when speaking with brain injury survivors. And I always speak in a calming tone. It definitely helps. Do you do cognitive evaluations? I do. Yes, I do. Awesome. Um, is there an average number of sessions for people with concussion syndrome? An average number. Okay. I'm going to go back to my line. You've seen one brain injury. You've seen one brain injury. So, I mean, it really depends on the severity of the injury the return goals. So like, what are you trying to return to? What's your goal? Um, and then like how much, well, again, insurance, whether we like it or not plays a role in it. But, um, I think it just depends. I aim for, I aim for 12. Um, and then I ebb and flow as we need. Um, sometimes it can be six, sometimes it can be 20, depending on the person. Nice. All right. Um, this was a comment somebody had on the topic of slowing rate of speech. Maggie once gave me a row of big colored dots to tap as I say each word, and it really helped with my communication with the person I support. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, could you say again, the location of the, the free modules on cognitive communication? Yeah, um, it is called, hold on. Can I write it somewhere for you guys? Can I put it in the Q&A? Um, no, I can't. Okay. Um, uh, Maggie, we can also send it out. So we'll okay. we'll make sure yeah. that in the follow-up materials, we have a yeah. link with the exact name of it. So no worries. Perfect. It, okay, so in case anybody's waiting with their pen in hand, it's called Interact, I-N-T-E-R. ACT dash ABI dash LIT ITY interactability is what it is the whole word, but they put ABI in the middle. This is a cognitive task for me to think through, but I think it's LITY at the end. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. No, that, that is like a really awesome resource. That's it was really cool. And I, once I found it, I was off on a, a tangent and like diving into the rabbit hole of taking them. I took all the, um, the modules and I thought they were phenomenal and they're all free. Yep. Fantastic. That's awesome. And since we have so many survivors and caregivers on mm -hmm. the, um, in the panel tonight, yeah, that's fantastic news to yeah. know. 
be able to use that. Thank you. Um, Let's see. It appears that many speech therapists hesitate to discuss that patients with aphasia tend to also have cognitive disorders. Why is this the case? Might be there. It's hard to speak for other therapists, but one, it might be their familiarity with the cognitive disorders. Two, it could be that the level of aphasia is so severe that they're trying to to tease out what is the aphasia and what is cognitive communication, which is really hard. It can get very messy. Um, So I think that especially in the beginning of a brain injury, we look at the timeline for that, that speech to get a little bit better to kind of tease out what cognitive impairments um, may follow. Okay. Nice. Uh, let's see. Do you find that people with brain injuries are successful with communication while using AAC devices or apps? Both. Um, I think, well, and AAC devices are now turning into apps. Um, so you have like actual devices that are like insurance-based devices, but you also have those same companies offering the app, um, on iPads now. So I do think that it is helpful, um, in a certain stage of recovery to introduce that, um, AAC because the goal, obviously, and always I say to my families, the goal is verbal communication. That's the goal, we will continue to work on it, but it's not fair for us to hold that person to that goal of verbal only and to increase that frustration because you increase that frustration, you decrease the motivation and you you find yourself with somebody who's more in the like borderline depression, like that's just not, we're holding back on something. So when they are able to, to wrap their head around an AAC device or an AAC app, I think it's absolutely beneficial to use them in tandem. Awesome. Okay. I think this is the last question. Uh, What's your Instagram handle? Or I guess your TikTok, wherever those videos are coming from, we want to see it now. (laughs) Guys, I haven't done it for a year. Now I'm going to have to bring it back. Yeah, <laughs> here's why. And I will share with all of you on here. I didn't, I haven't done it for a while because it takes so much brain power to figure out how to do a, t- a one minute video, but I am defy therapy services, um, on Instagram. Awesome. So just like what it says on my thing. And we, um, Carly, we had two more and oh, then, yes. um, yeah, we have two more and we are going to close our Q and a, but I have them in your, in your queue. Okay. And you, if you don't get your question and join us for a support group first Thursday of the month, I'm putting it out there. Love. Perfect. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So the last two questions then, what is an AAC? Like, what does that stand for? I don't even know yeah. what that is. Um, an assistive and augmentative communication device. So it's something that is a tech, some sort of technology or low tech um, device, which could be pictures to help um, get the words out. Um, so they, it might, the, tech, the device may just be pictures or like a spelling board um, that doesn't do anything, or it could be up to, you know, um, being able to speak out loud. It's called a speech generating device. So they, the person hits it or can control it with their eyes. Um, and the device speaks the message that they want. That's awesome. Okay. Now the really, really last question. (laughs) Um, Do you have any recommendations for neurologists in Delaware that are knowledgeable with brain injuries? Well, my reaction to that should be most neurologists should be uh, aware of brain injuries. Um, I, oh, I mean, I always default to, you know, Christiana, um, some of the bigger hospitals, but that's only because of my limited awareness, um, of neurologists. I work more closely with, um, 
PMNR doctors, so physical medicine and rehab doctors, um, is usually where the referrals come from and that um, close relationship uh, for rehab goals. So I, I'm sorry, I don't have like a name for you, but I would always, again, when you're on the phone, say, what is your experience with you know, traumatic brain injury? I'm looking for somebody who's going to help me with this recovery. And I want to plug Dr. Kumar also, because he's down in um, like around Dover, Delaware, neuro rehab. Yeah. 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 He's um, down in Dover, uh, Dr. Kumar, Haresh Kumar, and he is Delaware physiatry. Delaware physiatry. Okay. He's Nicole Ryan is at BB hospital as well, who does a lot of concussion and TBI. Mm-hmm. Could you say it again, Terry? I'm sorry. Yeah, her name is Nicole Ryan. Awesome. And she's at BB. And she's a neurologist? She's a neurologist, yep. Yeah, because we also have um, Dr. Chang, who's a um, PM&R doctor on our board too. He's at Christiana's. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Well, with that, let me turn it back over to Zawaya. She's got some reminders and some more helpful information for us. Thank you, Carly. That was a wealth of information. Wow. I am overwhelmed and heartfelt. So thank you so much, Maggie. That was wonderful. I would like to tell everyone, thank you for participating. And I will be sending out a follow-up email And I will send this at the end of the session. Within that email, I will include helpful links. Um, I will include the presentation that you just watched. A link to watch this actual presentation. Please share um, with your friends, your colleagues, your loved ones, survivors, caregivers. And um, I will also include information for any VIAD events that are planned for the month of March. Because March is Brain Awareness, Brain Injury Awareness Month. And we invite you to show your support for our community by wearing blue for the month of March. So on the next session that we have, which will be next Thursday at the same time, please wear blue um, if you are so inclined. Um, For those needing CEUs, you must watch all five sessions. At the end of each session, a code will be provided, um, which I will be providing shortly. And please send me an email at... um, admin, A-D-M-I-N, at biad.org. That's admin, A-D-M-I-N, at biad.org. With the code provided, once I receive that email, you will then receive an assessment form for you to fill out. And once all the assessments are completed, you will receive your CEU certificate via email. And we invite you to join us next Thursday, um, March 16th, from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Our topic will be gaps in service for brain injury survivors. And it will be presented by Dr. Harry, Terry Harrison Goldman with Newmore's Children's Health. Terry is also, Dr. Goldman is also one of our board members. Um, and, um, I want to say thank you for everyone. And I am going to go ahead and share the CEU code for those that need. All right. Hashtag rain buzz. Uh, so thank you all again so much for being here tonight Um, the questions, the interaction, everything, you guys were amazing. So I really hope you're all here next week, um, or if you can at least catch the next one on demand, Dr. Terry is like out of this world, unreal. So you guys are going to love it. And um, that's all I've got for you. Thank you guys again so much for being here tonight. I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank you guys. Thank you, Maggie. And goodbye. Thanks everybody. Bye.